singularity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a regular podcast feature of Singularity Weblog, where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. If you guys enjoy the show, you can help me make it better in many ways. You can click the like button on this video, you can leave a comment, or you can simply go and make a donation. As always, I will be the man with the questions, and today, the guest with the answers will be Professor Roman Yampolsky. Dr. Yampolsky is an assistant professor at the School of Engineering and director at the Cybersecurity Lab at the University of Louisville. He is also an alumni of Singularity University, uh, GSP-12, the year right after me, and a visiting fellow of the Singularity Institute, which was recently renamed MIRI, Machine Intelligence Research Institute. So, thanks for being with us, Roman. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. So, uh, let me begin with uh, the, the usual question that I open up my interviews, which is, if you were to introduce yourself and what you do in a couple of sentences, how would you do that? So I do run the cybersecurity lab, and that term is not well defined. The concept of security in the uh, domain of computers is very broad. We do work with uh, biometrics, which is recognition of humans. We look at uh, cryptography. We look at digital forensics. My personal interest is somewhere at the intersection of AI and security. How can uh, standard concepts of computer security apply to intelligent machines, to virtual worlds, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that, just like me, you grew up behind the Iron Curtain in the Eastern Bloc. Yeah. Uh, so, I'm very curious to find out how is it that you got interested in technology in general and artificial intelligence in particular, and why? I really don't see how the political aspect of it relates to interest in technology. I mean, that's well, sort of innate. We, we were living in a sort of, at least from my perspective, in a sort of a very technologically backwards kind of a world. I remember it was so hard for me to get any access to computers when I was a kid. I had to, and we had 8-bit computers, so uh, with basic uh, and, and I remember being grade 7 and, and having to either wait in lines or try to do all kinds of tricks to be able to get like for 10 minutes or 15 minutes on a computer or, and go the other end of the city. So technology was not like a big part of my childhood at all. I didn't have a Nintendo or a Game Boy. I, I played with sticks and stones personally. I, I rode a bicycle. That, those were, and I was doing all kinds of naughty things when I was a kid, but they didn't involve technology, unless it was starting a fire or something like that. But you're right, the technology was very desirable. You stood in line to spend five minutes playing a video game, and that's exactly how I got started. I loved video games, I had Sega Genesis, I had Nintendo. I mean, I spent most of my time playing video games. I thought I'm going to become a computer game developer at some point. Then I moved to US, I realized it's an addiction. I sold all my systems and I haven't touched since. I had a brief period of addiction to online poker. I overcame that as well. <laughs> so let me get this straight. You had access to those sort of Western video games like Sega and so on, even in the, in the Soviet Union? Uh, later, uh, after 89, 91, uh, I only moved here in 94, so oh, I, I had a brief period of uh, pretty good access to most of uh, technology. Exactly. Never had a PC while living there, so... Yeah, I, I never had a PC too, and I remember I I was, I don't know, grade 9 or, or grade 10 when I did all kinds of tricks and I actually was able to rent one 16-bit computer that was not being used in, in one library. Uh, and, uh, of course, they were Bulgarian computers, you know. Uh, in the Eastern Bloc, actually, Bulgaria was a substantial producer of computers and uh, CDs and, and things like that. I didn't know that, but my first computer, I actually found it at the local hospital in a dump, and it was a Soviet machine. I think it was an 8-bit machine, and it took me a week of programming to put single pixel on the screen. I was so proud of myself. <laughs> yeah, and they, they usually had like a TV, actually, an mm -hmm. actual TV on top, right? Like a, key, like a keyboard box, 
and a TV that you place on top. That's that's how I started. This. Tape based uh, program loading. You would put tapes in a recorder and yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, that was crazy. Those were the crazy times. And the, 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 the disk drives had so many problems reading and they kept breaking all the time. It was amazing. Anyway, uh, let's stop boring our audience with our personal stories here and then move on. So, uh, what's the motivation and the main goal of your work currently? Uh my hope is to make technology beneficial. So I do see amazing potential for all the exponential technologies, computers, obviously, artificial intelligence. But to ignore potential side effects, I think, is not wise. We accepted a lot of technologies without considering what they can do to us, and uh, sometimes it backfires. Look at something as trivial as cars. If somebody proposed the idea of cars today, we would never accept it. It kills 100,000 people every year. It pollutes the environment. But we're so used to the concept, we can't live without it. My hope is that technologies we're developing today will not have those side effects. We can make them safe and only have the beneficial angle to them. Mm -hmm. I kind of halfway agree with what you said, in the sense that do you not still think that car, cars were sort of a necessary evil, so to speak, because without the sort of transportation system of the cars, we would have not been able to develop our economy. Uh, the connect, the interconnectivity of the world, transporting goods, transporting people, uh, traveling around the world, that was all basically empowered by sort of the cheap cars that Ford pioneered himself in the beginning. Right, and I completely agree with the benefits of it. It's just, again, I'm more thinking about, well, could have would done the same thing but safer, better, oh, yeah, better okay. system for controlling cars, better street lights, something more intelligent yeah. to reduce the number of casualties. In that, in that uh, sense, I completely agree with you. Yes, yes, I agree. So tell us a little bit more about your research lab. What does it do and what are perhaps some of the major uh, findings that you have there. Okay, so the lab is part of engineering department, so we are less into sort of this philosophical future AI work and more into concrete things we can do today. Majority of my students work on biometric systems, mm -hmm. uh, something like behavioral biometrics, recognizing user from their interaction with computer, typing patterns, uh, mouse usage, interaction with different software, as well as face recognition, voice recognition. Um, we do look a little bit of, uh, at uh, recognition of uh, avatars in virtual worlds, so non-biological non entities trying to do linguistic profiling of chatbots and things like that. Mm -hmm. that's, that's probably the main area of research. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, as part of my preparation for this interview, I watched a number of your interviews and I read as many papers as I could. Um, I also happened to watch your Ignite presentation at Singularity University, GSP-12, that you have on you, your YouTube channel. And here's a quote I want to give, give you uh, that you said there, and uh, I want to ask you to elaborate on it. And you say, I'm a bit pessimistic. My job is to look at exponential risks of technologies such as AI. And you are talking about the differences between you and Ray Kurzweil's take on the exponential growth of technology. Would you mind elaborating more for us? Sure. So it's the same thing as with the example I gave yeah. you with cars. Uh, Ray yeah. talks about how technology is going de to develop and what we're going to get out of it. We'll have flying cars, we'll have smart tutors, but uh, I do feel that he does not emphasize what can go wrong with technology. So it's like someone saying, well, nuclear power is awesome, we're going to get all this free energy, ignoring possible accidents, ignoring nuclear weapons. That's mm -hmm. my perspective on it. I so, want to have a complete picture of technology. We looked at the positive, it's worth it, let's do it, but let's concentrate on safety mechanisms before it's too late. Uh -huh. So do you think that in a way Ray Kurzweil is like way too optimistic and not enough? Uh, in terms of prevention or sort of uh, uh, securing against the downsides of exponential technology? I would say so. I think he made well over 100 predictions, and if you look at them, 
either zero or maybe one or two of them have any obvious negative connotation to them. It's always how awesome it's going to be. It's never, <laughs> well, yeah, this can backfire somewhat. Mm -hmm. And if you think any technology is 50-50, it could be used for good and for bad uh, at the same time. So you do have to address it in almost equal measure. Mm -hmm. It's easier to sell heaven than to sell hell. So a lot of a lot of predictions should go towards let's invest money in this technology because that's what people are going to go for. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to jump right into the discussion of how we can actually uh, work towards securing or minimizing the negative potentialities of those uh, technologies. But I want to do that gradually. So I want to start with uh, sort of a general question here about your definition of artificial intelligence because people do have different interpretation of the term uh, and I just want to ask you what is artificial intelligence for you? So I guess the term has two potential definitions. What we're doing right now are different tools to assist us. Uh, some of those tools are very good, some of those tools are actually at the level or better than human mm -hmm. uh, agents. Uh, but the long-term goal of AI has always been to develop a system as capable as a human being, human-level intelligence, and uh, a system capable of uh, delivering that level of performance in all domains. Mm -hmm. Whatever a human being can do, the system should be able to be competitive, and very quickly such system would become superior in most domains just because it keeps learning, keeps adding to it. So the current systems we have... Uh, is all we can practice on. This is where we can limit uh, access, we can create some sort of safety mechanisms. Long term, we need to think about what happens when we have those human level intelligence uh, machines around us and how can we, if at all, control them, limit their influence on us. And that's the, that's the big question. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're actually making any reasonable progress towards that goal of creating artificial intelligence? Because I recently interviewed uh, Dr. Marvin Minsky, and he, he really surprised me in a way by saying that he didn't see much progress in artificial intelligence for the last uh, decade or maybe decades. Uh, actually, off the record, uh, during the conference where I met him, he told me that uh, a lot of bad ideas got to be very popular in the 70s and the 80s, and I don't think that he necessarily excluded himself from that claim, too. Um, though he might have, but I don't think he did. Uh, so, and he was even thinking that, he was even saying that he doesn't see uh, many promising uh, uh, sort of theories or, or, or teams that are towards, on the path towards artificial intelligence. What's your take on that? Have we made any progress? Are we making, are we likely to make more? I saw your interview with him, very good interview, and uh, I think you pointed out that uh, what about Watson, what about Google Translation, what about all those systems? Uh, I disagree. I think we're making amazing progress. We're not there yet, but uh, you can't deny the things we have done actually in the last 10 years. Uh, a lot of it is based on just the scale. We have a lot more powerful machines. We can do massive statistical processing. We're not better at understanding how human brain does those things, but we are much more successful at developing tools which can accomplish those things. And um, he's probably correct in that a lot of it is not being done in labs around the world, research labs, but companies like Google are now at the forefront of developing those technologies. So I would respectfully, uh, respectfully disagree with his uh, assessment. Mm -hmm. Let me give you another MIT luminary from a different discipline who uh, ironically enough, would actually agree with Dr. Minsky at least on this point, and that's uh, Professor Noam Chomsky, whom I'm trying to get on my show, by the way. Uh, he famously said, uh, Noam Chomsky, that is, famously said after uh, Deep Blue defeated Gary Kasparov that uh, the fact that computer defeated uh, the best human in chess was as interesting to him as a bulldozer winning the Olympics in weightlifting or something, something like that. Uh, now, since he's uh, one of the best-known linguists in the world, I'm dying to ask him in person what does he think about Watson defeating the two best humans ever in Jeopardy, uh, and, and whether that kind of thing uh, has influenced he, or changed his mind in any way. But I am, I am suspicious that he would 
perhaps point out that uh, those are more of a brute force approaches rather than real intelligence, uh, and that in, in that sense, the metaphor that he used of a bulldozer and weightlifting still kind of holds true, and, and therefore they may not be so interesting for him. What's your take on that kind of rationale or reasoning? Again, I, I disagree. I love brute force. I think that's the main algorithm, <laughs> most important algorithm. I have a paper defending it as the universal algorithm for obtaining intelligence. And if you think about it, we use exactly that. Human brain is so powerful. It's more powerful than any supercomputer available to us today or in 10 years. So that's what we use. I mean, we only got to that level by growing this large head and being able to crack all the data. We don't do it consciously. All that processing happens in the background, and then we get faced with a multiple choice, four options which we, as an expert system, would select from. And that's essentially what Watson was doing. A few choices popped up, and then it would select the top choice from top four, top five, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it doesn't really matter whether it's brute force or not. That's well, it, it doesn't matter as long as it works. I mean, yeah. I know in your interview, Minsky was kind of skeptical of the Turing test, but uh, it is a very objective way of seeing if a system is as good as a human being. It's really hard to argue that a system which passed Turing test is not intelligent. It's impossible to argue that. Yeah, Minsky, uh, the, the other bomb that Minsky threw during that interview was that he said that the Turing test is a joke. And you kind of preempted my next question, which is, what about the Turing test? What's your take on it? You, you said it's a great test, but is it really? I think so. Uh, again, to me, it measures exactly what we want to measure in uh, an intelligence test. We don't want something where, well, how good is it as a mathematician? How good is it at playing chess? Those are not fundamental properties of being an intelligent being and as intelligent as a human being. Whereas passing a Turing test is exactly that. If you can pass a Turing test, and I have a paper, I don't know if you had a chance to read it, about AI completeness. Mm -hmm. You can ask anything during a Turing test. Any problem can be reduced to a question on a Turing test. Yeah. So passing Turing test equates your capability to any uh, domain of expertise. You're as good as an engineer, as a teacher, as a writer, anything. So, but then, you know, uh, I know that you kind of usually try to stay away from the philosophical implications, but I can't resist it. Uh, so, w let's say that a machine to took and, and passed successfully the Turing test. What are the, the implications then? Do uh, What kind of attitude should we have towards that entity? Very difficult question, and uh, to me, a very dangerous situation. If we're already at that point, that means I fail to develop those safety mechanisms in time. Uh, basically, if you have human-level intelligence right now, that means in 20 minutes you have super intelligence. What happens in a week and a month, you just can't predict. At this point, you're no longer in control at all. The system is in control. Oh, so you think that... Once we have a computer passing successfully the Turing test, it's in a way too late. Uh, it's too late in the sense that it would quickly become super intelligent, and at that point you are not the smartest agent in the room, in the world. <laughs> so you're not the one making the decisions. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in that sense, then, you're, you're actually uh, thinking that the technological singularity may actually happen in what Werner Vinge calls a hard takeoff rather than a soft takeoff. Because I myself have to admit, I think that the way I see things, if it were to happen, the more likely path to, for me uh, would be a soft takeoff. I, I think there's a few times that we would have hiccups uh, that potentially will have uh, what uh, Jaron Lanier calls the blue screen of death. Uh, or glitches in the system, and, and I, I don't think we'll get it right from the very first time, in other words. So I think there, it would be a likely to be a little bit more gradual than rather than, boom, we have equal to human intelligence, and then in 20 minutes after it's 100 times smarter, and two days later it's like a trillion times, and forget about it. You I think we're going to have the soft part and problems, but that's going to precede the machine passing the Turing test. That's going to be the path to develop machine capable of it. But once you get to that point, what prevents it from jumping to the next level very quickly? It's already as good as you at anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So perhaps now is the time to ask you, what's your take on the technological singularity in general? Should we be worried about it? Should we be happy and optimistic about it? And what's the what's somebody like the average person supposed to do about it anyway, to prepare? Well, we should be realistic about it. It's very likely to happen, and it has, like any other technology, a positive and a ne negative uh, aspect to it. So depending on your perception of uh, our relationship with those super intelligent machines, you might be less or more optimistic. Uh, someone who's looking at Kurzweil in a uh, way of looking at the world, his predictions would think will merge with machines. So we're going to be part of that super intelligent revolution, just we're going to stop stop being humans, we're going to become cyborgs and move on that way. Someone else might think, well, what can biological artifact add to that super intelligent machine? Nothing. So we're going to be removed from the system altogether. So that's a much less desirable scenario. I definitely see it as a very important uh, future point in human history, probably the most important uh, one. So um, how to how to react to it uh, for an average person? There is not much they can do. It's like asking, okay, the universe is going to collapse on itself. What should you do as an average consumer? And then not much you can do. <laughs> well, in, in that case, does it mean that the only people who can do anything about that are the sort of people like you, people who are professors or experts in the field who are working in it, and basically? We're leaving the faith of humanity to the technocrats. We are, in a sense, and I'm not even sure that, uh, forget me, but even top-notch technical people can do anything about it. It's one of those things uh, which might just happen regardless of what we try to do to stop it or slow it down. It might be a natural uh, point of, uh, you know, all the curves, everything going towards that singularity, essentially. That's exactly what it is. Um, I'm still not sure if there is a way for us to prevent it or to control it uh, to make it safe enough, but uh, I'm certainly trying to invest time in researching that. So you're not sure you can make a difference, but you are still trying to do it nevertheless. Because, I mean, if you can't really make the difference, then that would mean that the work of people like yourself or like the Machine Intelligence Research Institute is kind of pointless. In a sense, if you knew for a fact that you can't, then it would be. But if you think about it this way, let's say there is a tiny probability that we can succeed. Mm -hmm. Tiny. Mm -hmm. Multiply it by the value at stake, all of humanity, which is to me like infinity. Mm -hmm. It's still a significant uh, value. You should try it. You shouldn't mm -hmm. just say, nah, it's not worth it, I'll do something else. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree entirely with that. And actually that kind of connects well with... If I remember when I interviewed Michael Anisimov, uh, and I asked him what are our chances of survival, he surprised me at the time by giving me a number of like 15% or something like that, if I remember off the top of my head. That was a few years ago. But what, in your opinion, would be our chance of survival if you were to be pinned down and, and ask for a percentage point of probability? But how do you define survival? If we merge with machines and become cyborgs, did we survive? Is it zero? Is it 100%? It really depends on your definition. If we move to a virtual world and exist as software uploads, is that survival? Is uh, going back to what we had 100 years ago, sort of Amish lifestyle, is that the way? It really depends on how you define success here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what in your view is the best definition of it then? The best definition of survival? Of success or survival. Uh, what I'm trying to do through my research is kind of develop tools which allow us to move this singularity point a little into the future so we have more room to make decisions, more, more time to figure out what to do. So I would love to see us stay at sort of the current state, maybe some improvements in terms of tool AI, but not quite jump to the super intelligent machine level. So in a way, you're, trying, you're saying that in a way you're trying to delay or slow down the progress towards the singularity. Absolutely. And push it uh, further forward in time so that it gives us more time to perhaps prepare for it. Exactly. Better understand the technology, better 
uh, get ready in terms of uh, political uh, set of laws, uh, ethics, morals. We don't have anything right now in the books uh, which is capable of dealing with an intelligent machine. Our legal structure is not ready. Economic structure is not ready. All those things would collapse even with human-level AIs being out there, not even super-intelligent ones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And realistically speaking, what I mean, how do you think you can do that? I mean, uh, what, are, what is the effect that you can exert on, I don't know, some foreign country's military trying to develop artificial intelligence in their research labs, for example, whether it's Israel, whether it's, I don't know, Iran, whether it's, uh, I don't know, France, United Kingdom, Russia, for example, uh, I'm not really concerned about Iran developing AI. I think it's going to be U.S. military, which is at the <laughs> forefront of it. They've been funding it since uh, the 60s, as Minsky said. I mean, most money came from uh, military yeah. research funding. Yeah, so, so even in the U.S. military, what's your ability to impact or influence on, on the progress and slow it down in a way? Very little. The best I can do is give interviews to journalists such as yourself, hope that the public understands the problem and then influences the process through elections. Uh, small chance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I don't even know what to say here now. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so, hmm. let's, let's go back and talk a little bit more about the ethical dimensions, uh, about machines being able to pass the Turing test. Now, uh, in one of the papers that I was reading here, you're talking about uh, leak-proofing the singularity. Mm -hmm. And you're offering, like, a protocol with eight levels of security, which would sort of isolate or contain, if you, if you will, the artificial intelligence within a secure uh, realm that... Uh, we would be able to control and, and, and prevent from spreading beyond that. So tell us a little bit about your ideas behind leak-proofing the singularity. Again, so it's a tool to delay uh, this onset of technological singularity. Suppose a company, let's say Google or someone similar, uh, is very successful in developing a uh, human simulator. They hired Trey Kurzweil as director of engineering recently. He has a book, How to Create a Mind. I'm sure he's working on a project related to the book. As we get uh, closer to the goal, through soft path or hard path, whatever it is, they'll get to a point where they have a system as capable as a toddler, as capable as a six-year-old, seven-year-old. Mm -hmm. Instead of throwing it out there as a Google search enhancement on the internet, I say have it in a standalone machine separated from access to all the information, perform experiments on it, see if it's safe, see if it's uh, something you can uh, provide additional restrictions to. Think of it as uh, capturing an alien intelligence. If we were to catch a guy on Mars, we wouldn't just release him into the public, give him right to vote and forget about it. We would lock him up in a lab and study him pretty carefully. Same concept. <laughs> But do we have the right to do that and, and ethically? And, and let me try to switch the metaphor around a little bit. Think about it as, uh, say, the black rights movement, right? In the 1960s, uh, before that it was the women's rights movement. Uh, first, uh, neither women nor, nor blacks were uh, allowed to vote. Uh, eventually, through you know, a, a substantial struggle on both communities, uh, that limitation was overcome, but, uh, and now we have what's called universal human rights. It used to be only the male rights, and, and even before that, it, it was the male property owners, usually the nobility, right? So, that's like saying, well, we're not sure if we should get women voting or if we should get blacks the vote or, or liberate them from slavery. Maybe we should lock them in a lab or in a concentration camp. And, and start studying them and make sure that first it will be safe for us before we give them any rights. Right. The situation is very different. Uh, the examples you bring up, you're already dealing with a situation where you have equal agents created and now you're deciding how to allocate rights to them. But who the said they were equally created? I mean, 
the church and, and the Bible and, and, and pretty much many famous people of reputation for thousands of years used to say that women are inferior, that other races were inferior to the white race, and, and nobody said for thousands of years that we were created equal. Actually, people used to say that there's a natural order to this world, and white males usually were supposed to stand at the top of the pyramid. All right, so I'm not an expert on the Bible. I'm not going to give you a comment on that. But, uh, <laughs> I have a comment in my paper on rab uh, robotics and AI. Sure. They should be inferior by design. We are the gods in this situation. We are creating them. It's up to us to design them to either have uh, ability to feel pain or not, for example. An entity deserves moral respect and ethical treatment if it's capable of suffering. It's up to us to decide if this capability is included or not. So... The other difference is you brought up voting rights and all this. Um, all those entities you mentioned have similar design, similar DNA, where different and very superficial capabilities. Uh -huh. Software, on the other hand, can be copied quite easily. If you have one intelligent program today, you can have a trillion in 10 seconds. Uh -huh. Allowing a system like that to vote as an equal quickly takes out all the human beings out of equation. Basically, at this point, even in a democratic process, a machine takes over. Mm -hmm. So you can't really compare them to historical examples. They are very different. So you tend to seriously disagree with people like Nick Bostrom, who have written uh, on the topic about uh, speciesism, or what they call biologism, I think, and, and how we shouldn't be talking about human rights, but intelligence rights, and how substrate is practically irrelevant mm -hmm. as long as you have intelligence. I read uh, his work on this, and I, I want to switch more of, uh, to a book by Hugo de Garis, his Artelect War book. He basically makes an argument that uh, those things would be superior to us and should have more rights and better rights, and we should not even be in contention. We have a bacteria in that equation. Uh -huh. And to me, I am very speciesist. I believe human beings are the ones I'm <laughs> here to serve and protect, and I really don't want the situation to change. I mean, from point of view of someone in a different galaxy, universe, it may be very speciesist, but uh, I'm willing to take a label. <laughs> very good, yeah. I, one of the, actually, the, the most popular interviews that I've ever done was the interview with uh, Professor de Garis um, ab uh, uh, about his book, The Artilect War, and so on. So uh, let me bring a couple of points that he brings there then. Do you think that conflict is inevitable between people uh, that he calls the cosmists, uh, such as, for example, Ray Kurzweil definitely will be among those cosmists, and people that he calls Terrans, uh, that is, people who are technological Amish, as he calls them, who would oppose that progress that Ray Kurzweil is pushing forward, and therefore he believes that there will be this kind of inevitable conflict, what he calls a giga war, uh, with giga death. I think it's very likely. We're starting to see some of it already show up. Uh, we started discussion with uh, uh, discussion of conservative radio and transhumanism a little bit, and you can see already some of this uh, picking up steam from that uh, group of people. So definitely there is a debate of uh, how should humanity change, what alterations are possible and should be done. Uh, so, yeah, I agree with uh, Dr. De Garis on that. Mm -hmm. Well, so in that sense, let me ask you this, though. I, I watched your interviews uh, for Alex Jones's show, uh, and I, I suspect you might be referring to, to his audience when you say that, or to that show. So, aren't you in a way pouring oil into the fire then? By, by going multiple times on his interview and talking about those issues and sort of feeding into the paranoia and... Well, if you actually watch the interview, I was the one defending Ray Kurzweil and transhumanism as a very beneficial technology. It would help the disabled, it would help our economy, it will help education. Uh, perhaps the problems uh, these people present are problems of being miseducated about the topic. It's not because they're evil, it's because they don't understand the 
technology or the goals of technology. So I think by going on the show and educating this uh, segment of population, I'm greatly benefiting everyone, not uh, pouring oil into the fire. <laughs> Okay, I, I hope so. I, I absolutely hope so. I was actually myself uh, hypothetically considering if I were to go out to be invited to the Alex Jones show, whether I would go uh, or not. And on the one hand, I wanted to say, oh, no, definitely not. On the other hand, I felt, well, but on the other hand, it would be a great opportunity to debate the issues with an audience which is traditionally not perhaps engaging those topics. So I sort of went back and forth within myself like that for a while, and I could not reach a conclusion. I have to admit, I, I was kind of at a stalemate. Uh, there were strong reasons pro and strong reasons con. So, because you know, some people would say, "Well, you'll never be able to change people's minds." It, in a way, it's like going and debating in a church and telling people there's no God, right? Well, a lot of people do it. Dawkins tries to debate. Uh, yeah, I've done it myself, too, on, on multiple occasions. And, and I have to say, uh, I have had some partial success, limited one occasionally, but the vast majority of cases it has been a total failure. You can't measure success right after the debate. You're planting a seed and it may take 10, 20, 30 years for that seed to grow, and then one day it uh, clicks and... You, you can't uh, disqualify yourself from this uh, struggle just yet. Mm -hmm. take, take time with it. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree with you. I'm, I'm not disqualifying myself. I'm just saying that perhaps so far I, I don't think I'm, I'm having the impact that I'm hoping I would be having <laughs> of opening up people's minds. And, and I, I, I'm usually not trying to enforce my opinions on people. I just want to open up the possibility, the discussion, the, the consideration for a wider field of view mm -hmm. uh, rather than a very limited theological or yeah, even, you know, technological if it were. That's why, you know, I, I often invite skeptics on my show and I've had religious transhumanists and all kinds of views. And you definitely learn a lot more by conversing with someone who disagrees with you than with someone who agrees with you 100%. You learn nothing from that. Absolutely, yeah. I've actually learned a lot from, from people who uh, I was surprised. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. You, another great point. So, Roman, let me ask you to tell us a little bit more about your book. Uh, what's the title, uh, the book that you're working on right now? What's the title? What's the? I think that's the cover that I see there behind uh, you. It is, yes, uh, this year. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, what's the title? What's the topic? What's the goal? How's so, the, the book is called Artificial it? Superintelligence, A Futuristic Approach. It's a play on a very popular book, Artificial Intelligence, A Modern Approach by uh, head of research at Google, and uh, the book is more philosophical than uh, engineering. Again, we're talking about safety mechanisms for systems we don't yet have. It's hard to run experiments to do anything practical. You don't have a way to test the mechanisms. But it does talk about things like how do we define superintelligence, how do we measure it, how do we attempt to restrict it. So what you brought up, a paper on leak proofing is part of it, the uh, communication protocol. It also talks about some of the work we've been doing with uh, uh, wisdom of artificial crowds, virtual uh, world security, things of that nature. So basically anything I uh, published in the last uh, four years, let's say, is uh, influencing the book. And uh, uh, the way I was doing it, I was uh, crowdfunding an initial campaign, and a lot of people had an option to uh, fund at the level of an editor where they can contribute to the book, uh, proofread the book, help guide it towards uh, better quality, I would hope. Mm -hmm. So, where are you at right now with, uh, with the mm -hmm. progress along the... So, we finished the crowdfunding campaign. We are currently, well, I am currently in the process of uh, writing and finalizing a few chapters. There is still probably four or five chapters which need to be written from scratch. I'm also currently trying to get the book peer-reviewed to see if it can be published through a more mainstream publishing uh, process. Whatever it succeeds or not, it doesn't matter. It's going to be published no matter what, either as an independent uh, mm -hmm. book or as a standard academic publication. Mm -hmm. 
so uh, what's the, the main thesis, if you, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us, of the book? Or do you have a clear thesis at this moment? Uh, there is a short uh, abstract. If your readers are interested, they can look it up. Uh, just Google the title of the book. Uh, it, it is the first uh, result on it. But basically it goes, in the next uh, 20 to maybe 200 years, we're definitely going to get to a point where we have human level intelligent machines and very quickly they would go to the next level I'm not arguing whatever it's going to take a day a week but uh, in historical terms it's going to be a very quick process and now how do we make sure that it benefits us not hurts us that's the main thesis of a book I'm looking at what others have proposed to deal with this situation and I'm trying to propose a few things of my own uh, also identify the actual problems we might face issues with uh, security of the utility function, ethical aspects, exactly what you brought up with uh, rights and ethics, how do we treat or mistreat such entities, um, the types of AIs we might encounter. So uh, mm -hmm. basically covers a lot of my research interests. Let me talk a little bit more again about ethics here, because you said this book is a little bit more philosophical. I also read a paper by you called Artificial Intelligence Safety Engineering, why machine ethics is a wrong approach. And in the beginning, in the abstract, you say, we will argue that the attempts to allow machines to make ethical decisions or to have rights are misguided. Mm -hmm. Now, we already talked a little bit about the rights, so let me talk, talk about the ethical decisions. Yeah. Now, uh, one of the things that we have in common with, with you, not, not only growing up in the Eastern Bloc, but... Uh, I actually wrote uh, the reason why, the, the way that I kind of got exposed to the idea of the singularity was for my major research paper for my master's degree, uh, which was on artificial intelligence in times of war. And uh, in my paper I argued that uh, what we're witnessing in Afghanistan and in Iraq may be uh, for the first time increasingly autonomous machines making increasingly automated decisions about whether a human being would live or die. Now, is that not an ethical decision? It is, and I'm completely against machines making that decision. The whole point is that the debate, it, it, there is an illusion that there is a lot of debate and a lot of research in machine ethics community about what to do and how to do it. If you look at the actual papers, all the debating is whose ethical system we should encode into the robots. Should it be uh, Christian ethics? Should it be utilitarian ethics? Should it be uh, Judaic ethics? But uh, there is no debate about, well, is it a good idea to have a super powerful utilitarian agent deciding what to do with humans? And uh, my answer is no. None of those systems are universal in the sense that they are accepted by all of people. And uh, they backfire. They've all been shown to have terrible loopholes. Uh, utilitarian ethics is one great example. You might try to slightly improve happiness of billions but sacrifice thousands in the process. So uh, I would say the goal is not to even put machines in that uh, position where they make decisions about life or death for human beings. And military complex is going that route. And uh, again, I don't see a very good solution to how to stop it. Yeah, because the, the, unfortunately, I agree with you entirely, but unfortunately that process is unfolding and ongoing already. I mean, most of those drones take off on their own, they fly on their own, they land on their own, they can even refuel in the air on their own. Uh, there are actually a few uh, models of armed robots uh, which are absolutely entirely capable of shooting on their own. They still have a, a, an operator but they don't have to. Uh, the, yeah. the two ones that I'm referring specifically are um, deployed, I think, in the DMZ between North and South Korea. One's produced by Samsung, and I'm trying to remember the other company's name, but it's uh, escaping me right now. It's, it's a South Korean company where uh, they're sort of guarding the border, if you will. And they both have operators, but they don't have to. They can be, uh, they're already uh, capable of being completely automated, where you, you basically uh, click off manual and switch it on full auto, and they can identify, engage, and fire at a target that they've identified on their own, self-sufficiently. 
Right, and the problem is those are not super intelligent machines. Those are standard tools, and they use standard pattern recognition algorithms, which we know can be overtrained. They can make yeah. incorrect decision, and any time the system selects its own target, I mean, you go, okay, go to Afghanistan, select all the bearded guys. I mean, it's an easy <laughs> recipe for disaster here. So definitely, you can see an obvious problem with this approach. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with you, but then what do we do? I mean, so machines, we, we can agree that machines shouldn't be making those decisions, and yet chances are they will be, and they are making those decisions. And we already have thousands of people killed by drones, and you can say, yes, there's an operator there, but the operator is making the decision based on the input provided by the machine, if you will. Uh, and, and so they already have a huge impact on the decision-making process and, and the way automatization works, uh, you know, we are always moving towards less human involvement rather than more. So what do we do about it? I mean, how can we, can you stop that with a law? And if you could stop it in the U.S., uh, then somebody else wouldn't care about it and they'll, they'll automate it. I agree with you completely. It's a very difficult problem, an open problem, and we are just now starting to look at it. In fact, most people don't even consider it a problem even in AI community, so that's, that's why I'm so concerned. Yeah, that, that was actually, to tell you the truth, my major concern and, and, and the major thesis of my, of my paper, in, uh, which I wrote in about 2008, I think. Uh, but, but also, to tell you the truth, uh, that paper didn't ring very well with uh, my supervisors and... Uh, for a number of reasons, uh, they so they let you graduate, so I assume it was good enough. I yeah, well, I I, I graduated with a B plus uh, on that paper, which is like the lowest passing grade, uh, if you will. And they didn't, I don't know, they didn't think it very well written or very uh, logical or important in the grander scheme of things. Uh, anyway, it's it's a whole other story uh, of its own. So. Let's talk maybe a little bit about, somebody may say, well, what about the laws of robotics, right? We have had uh, proposals, uh, if you will, uh, for the laws of robotics, you know, uh, rule number one, don't kill humans, for example, right? Uh, what, what about the laws of robotics as a way of sort of provide guidance for uh, any artificial intelligence? You know, let me just read them so that uh, people get refreshed a little bit. The three original laws of robotics, as defined by Isaac Asimov in 1942, so that's 70 years ago, go as follows. Number one, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow human being to come to harm. Law two, a robot must obey any orders given to it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And robot three, a robot, I mean, uh, law three, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or the second law. Isn't that a good guiding mechanism of preventing and solving all of our problems? Have you actually read the books by Asimov? In oh, every okay. single book he uses the laws, it backfires terribly. In fact, he invented them as a literary tool to show that it's not a good solution. Uh, people often quote this uh, as some magical set of commandments. Yes, don't kill humans. But uh, very quickly, if you analyze it, uh, it becomes impossible to implement. What is a human? Should the system now implement anti-abortion laws? Should it be implementing anti-euthanasia laws? I mean, uh, those are trivial questions, but the interaction of the three laws uh, makes it next to impossible to, to actually use in practice. Mm -hmm. And when I say, by the way, just to correct myself, when I said all of them, I mean, I've read all of the iRobot books that Asimov wrote, and I've read a few others, but I certainly haven't read all of his books, because he has, I think, like 400 of them. Yeah. So <laughs> I certainly have not read all of them. I've read the iRobot collection. Uh, and and they're, they're, by the way, both witty and, and hilarious, so I recommend them for anyone who hasn't. So then the laws of robots of robotics don't work as we know them. Why do we think that sort of the leak proofing the singularity structure that you offer would be any better successful than, than that? 
It has a very different uh, goal. Uh, supposed laws are there to make systems safe uh, in indefinite time spans. What I'm proposing is a way to buy us a little more time. It's sort of an extra wall between us and the uh, singularity point. Maybe it will buy us 10 years, maybe 15. I'm not suggesting by any means that it's perfectly safe and once we implement that, it's going to be uh, a perfect world. Just very different use of tools. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Roman, um, in one of your papers here that I read, and I'm trying to find the quote, you are quoting actually two people that I have uh, uh, also written a little bit about, the Unabomber, Ted mm -hmm. Kaczynski, and Samuel Butler. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me ask you, first of all, about uh, the Unabomber. And I'm trying to... Oh, yeah, I think that's... The quote that you have from Ted is... Uh, it might be argued that the human race would never be foolish enough to hand over all the power to the machines, but we are suggesting neither that the human race would voluntarily turn power over to the machines, nor that the machines would willfully seize power. What we do suggest is that the human race might easily permit itself to drift into a position of such dependence on the machines that it would have no practical choice but to accept all of the machines' decisions. As society and the problems that face it become more and more complex and machines become more and more intelligent, people will let machines make more of their decisions for them simply because machine-made decisions will bring better results than man-made ones. Eventually, a stage may be reached at which the decisions necessary to keep the system running will be so complex that human beings will be incapable of making them intelligently. At that stage, the machines will be in effective control. People won't be able to just turn the machines off because they will be so dependent on them that turning them off would amount to suicide. I want you to talk a little bit about that. So we're already seeing this. If you think about what machines control today, probably 90% of the stock market, nuclear power plants, electrical grid, uh, space travel, all those things are already fully controlled by machines and in most cases we can't even switch it to manual because a human being cannot handle fast enough complexity of the uh, device, the number of measurements coming in. So the prediction is spot on. I mean, uh, we're already at the point where we cannot go back to uh, human decision making 100% and not sacrifice the lifestyle we're used to. And, and, and then what do you say to somebody who tells you, well, that was just a sort of a murderous, new Luddite, technophobic psychopath terrorist? I'll agree with it. He was. But it doesn't mean that he wasn't right about something. He was a brilliant mathematician, after all. So when it comes to science, he had uh, reasonably good ideas. I definitely don't agree with his uh, approach to solving problems or his social views, but... Uh, when it comes to math, he was uh, considered very solid. Mm -hmm. So the other sort of, uh, should I say, intellectual probably father of Ted Kaczynski's ideas a uh, hundred years before that was Samuel Butler. Uh, now Samuel uh, wrote a, a few books uh, such as, for example, Darwin Among the Machines and Eric Horn. Um, and there he sort of made very early on the same claims that Ted made. For example, uh, in one place he said, Day by day, however, the machines are gaining ground upon us. Day by day, we're becoming more subservient to them. More men are daily bound down as slaves to tend them. More men are daily devoting the energies of their whole lives to the development of mechanical life. The upshot is simply a question of time, but that the time will come when the machines will hold the real supremacy over the world and its inhabitants is what no person of truly philosophic mind can for a moment question. Our opinion is that war to the death should be instantly proclaimed against them. Every machine of every sort should be destroyed by the well-wisher of his species. So he's not a proud species. <laughs> Let there be no exceptions made, no quarter shown. Let us at once go back to the primeval condition of the race, if it be urged 
that this is impossible under the present condition of human affairs, this at once proves that the mischief is already done. And basically what he calls for is destroying all technology before the industrial, until we get back to the level of before the industrial revolution, and then we keep it there. We, we basically destroy progress and hold it permanently at the level of, say, the 1700s or 1750s England. What do you think of that solution? Um, that's pretty extreme. I was amazed when I found the quote at how long ago it was written. It, it's quite amazing. At the time, there was no robots, there was no internet, there was no computers. He was writing about automation of sewing process, and he already was able to foresee that far in advance. I mean, uh, again, another very brilliant guy, probably socially awkward by modern standards, but... Uh, uh, we should not completely ignore something just because somewhere else the writing has uh, undesirable ethical propositions. We should still look at it and see is there any value in it, even by modern standards. Uh, I don't advocate uh, destroying cars or bicycles or anything like that, but uh, the point he's trying to make is that, uh, yes, we can place ourselves in a situation of complete dependence and then later on, we just stop being useful. I mean, at some point, what is it we're doing if the machines do everything else? So you, you sort of disagree with the medicine. So you, you accept the diagnosis in a way that, that Samuel and Ted give. You disagree with the medicine or the treatment that they both... All right. What they're saying is like, okay, cancer is bad. The only way to fight cancer and win is to kill all humans. It's a little extreme. Yeah, it's going to cure cancer, but uh, it's not the way I want to go. So, so, well, Samuel says we should kill all machines, not all humans. He says war to the death where no quarter should be given to the machines, basically. Right. But already we see the other quote is coming through. We are dependent on machines. They are life support. They are help for disabled. They are yeah. uh, medical treatment. So by destroying them, we'll be killing part of humanity, which, again, I'm mm -hmm. not supporting. So, so does that mean that, that your uh, sort of proposal is kind of the, the best way forward for humanity, what you, ca what you call leak-proofing the singularity in a way? It's one of the things, again, the research so far is mainly looking at what problems we're likely to encounter. Okay. So we talk about uh, one being a redundancy of humanity. They're not going to need us, so we're going to pass away that way. The other one is uh, combining of us with humanity. We become cyborgs, we start being human. But there are also more trivial things. You develop a system, somebody can hack it. The system can have a virus. The system can be poorly programmed. Those are things we can do something about and improve on. Those are standard uh, problems in computer security and software engineering design. And uh, we know how to deal with them. So we don't have to look at it uh, as a single problem. We can compartmentalize it and go, okay, I know how to make system uh, which verifies its own code against viruses. I know how to uh, prevent outsiders from messing with the database. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'm suggesting. Let's do what we can with uh, current tools, with current technologies, and maybe slow down as much as we can through political process or anything else, development of systems we have no idea how to deal with. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Very interesting. So, uh, speaking about uh, algorithms and stuff like that, you said that one of your other interests is also cryptography. So, I just want to ask you for a brief comment on the NSA surveillance programs and cryptography. What is the best way, in your opinion, to sort of ensure our communications uh, to remain private, if you will, against the definite brute force that the NSA's machines have uh, in sort of deciphering anything that we try? Well, for most of us, it's not a problem because we're not important. We're really nobodies and nobody cares to read our correspondence, especially when you have access to much more interesting correspondence. So unless you are one of the top people in the world in terms of your financial impact or influence, you probably don't have to worry about it. Your personal communications with your girlfriend will remain yours. Nobody's going to waste time to decipher them. Uh, on the other hand, if you ask someone whose information is valuable for whatever reason, positive or negative, there are very good uh, cryptographic tools you can use. Um, I would also recommend not just uh, encrypting your communication channel by hiding it, 
uh, steganography is another interest of mine, and there are great ways to communicate without revealing that you're actually communicating, inserting uh, information in images, videos, maybe this interview. Uh, mm -hmm. There are lots of ways of uh, going about that, which uh, at least to the best of knowledge of scientific community are still not broken. So. Mm -hmm. Now, I am also uh, going to be doing an interview with uh, Jordi Rose, uh, who is the head of D-Wave Computers mm -hmm. uh, uh, in uh, British Columbia, in Vancouver, uh, arguably the first uh, quantum computer manufacturer and, and seller in the world. Um, and there are many people who would say, well, once we have quantum computers, uh, you know, on the market, and we already know Google bought one, uh, I think McDonnell Douglas or Boeing uh, bought another one, then basically no uh, codes would be safe. Is that true to say? It's not true. Uh, quantum breaking only applies to crypto systems based on integer factorization, and not all systems are based on that algorithm. Majority of uh, currently used algorithms do rely on it, but we can very quickly switch to other approaches which are not uh, uh, based on integer factorization. And there are problems, again, related to quantum computers. People talk about cryptocurrency like Bitcoin being based on this approach. Again, there is a way to upgrade and uh, move on from this. As far as I know, there is still debate in general about how capable quantum computers are developed by D-Wave and... Uh, I haven't seen them break any crypto protocols, even the short key ones. So, mm -hmm. yeah. To tell you the truth, that's one of the questions that I part that I plan to ask uh, Jordi. But um, if you had the chance to ask him a question, what would you ask him? No, yeah, that's well. Uh, I would be curious, uh, I know Google and NASA together purchased a quantum computer yes. to supposedly outfit their AI lab. I would be curious to see if they think there is uh, any connection between uh, the way humans think and quantum physics. I know you interviewed uh, people dealing with uh, quantum consciousness and things of that nature who claim the way human brain works is through quantum effects. So I was wondering if it's Google position that in fact you need quantum effects to simulate, uh, mm -hmm. to create a mind. Well, on the one hand, I, I would venture to say Google probably, since Ray Kurzweil is very prominent in that project, we know that Ray is absolutely adamant that there is no quantum mechanical uh, physics involved in, in sort of the neural processing of our brains, if you will. He is very adamant about that. Actually, uh, I, I was kind of surprised about how sharp he was during the Global Future 2045 conference in New York City when he said straight up, that's wrong, and we know that that's wrong. But I think we're talking about two different issues. One is creating an intelligent machine capable of doing all those things. The other one is consciousness, and we haven't talked about it, but to me it's a very different issue. Mm -hmm. You can have an intelligent machine which is not conscious in any way. It doesn't yeah, yeah. It in. Uh, that's a different story. So I think uh, he's not wrong or right, he's just talking about something else. Yeah, no, I'm not saying if he's right or wrong, I'm just saying that he thinks that uh, Professor Stuart Kamarov, whose uh, interview I'm, I'm kind of working on to edit, and it will be probably posted in the next couple of weeks, uh, Ray was very adamant that Kamarov uh, is wrong uh, in his claims, uh, which were supposedly uh, supported by the British physicist uh, Roger Penrose. But they are definitely within the minority opinion. Anyway, um, Roman, we have been talking uh, with you for about an hour now, and I'm really enjoying this, but uh, we uh, have to respect uh, the time of our audience, too. So let me close our interview with the last two questions. And the first one is, where can people find more about you and your work? Uh, Googling my name or the title of my book definitely works. Just Google Roman Yampolsky, Artificial Superintelligence, a Futuristic Approach, lots of interviews, papers, everything available on my website. Uh, so, yeah, mm -hmm. feel free to get in touch if you have interesting project possibilities, you want to collaborate on something. I'm always, always open to smart people. Fantastic. And if there's a final message that you would like our audience to take away from our conversation here today, what would you like that to be? What's the most important thing that you want to send out there? 
I would uh, again reiterate the message I've been trying to convey through the whole interview. Every new technology, whatever it's nanotech, robotics, AI, it doesn't matter. All those exponential technologies have both negative and positive effects. Before deciding on what to do with them, devote some time to considering both aspects and maybe asking, do we have brakes for a car developed before we start selling cars? Spend time on making sure the product you uh, releasing is safe for consumption. Uh, AI is subject to product liability laws or should be like any other product. And, uh, that's, that's what I hope your viewers will get from this. Dr. Yampolsky, thank you very much for spending time with us today. Thank you for inviting me. It was great.